hope everyone's having I wanted to post this um, political ideologies PowerPoint for you guys as a supplement for what you'll be reading in your lessons today uh, for the whole week. This is a PowerPoint that I presented to my students at Texas A&M um, and it really just should help clarify some of the concepts behind political ideologies. So let's take a look. The first thing that we can look at is what an ideology is. So an ideology is an, a plan or a general vision on how to improve society. So it's kind of different from a political party. Political parties are generally people who come together to elect people into office, whereas they can generally share a political ideology. Um, it's a belief system that can be improved by certain doctrines. Um, you might hear about an ideology that transforms into a social movement. Um, they hold things together. They're the underlying belief in politics. So generally everyone in a political party has a similar, if not the same, political ideology. Um, but they don't necessarily have to. Um, but they do hold things together, and that does include social movements. So p an individual who passionately believes about an ide ideology might be a somebody who tries to change a social movement or start a social movement. We can consider um, Bernie Sanders as an ideologue for the social movement of the Our Revolution during this last presidential campaign. Um, and they're generally going to be the leader of a social movement. Pragmatic ideologies are generally ideologies that don't focus on any one particular theory of government as much as they use whatever works to get uh, to their end game. So we can consider something like Donald Trump being a pragmatic ideologue. He believes firmly, very passionately about um, his particular social movement or change in government. And he doesn't really stick to any particular theory about how to run government as much as he does consider using pragmatism or whatever works to uh, get done what he needs to get done. The other concept is called nationalism, and this is relatively new. Um, and that's this phenomenon that leaders use to mobilize politics to action. The idea that America, uh, we should stick together, we're closer together, stronger together, to use that to form a foundation for getting um, a movement started or to mobilize people into action. We need to come together as Americans to solve this problem and that's what they use as the background for um, their movement. Now currently you probably are familiar with two basic ideologies liberalism and conservatism, right? That's what you hear about all the time. Um, but there's actually a lot of different current ideologies. There's classical liberalism versus modern liberalism, which are almost polar opposites from each other. Uh, conservatism, socialism, and just plain libertarianism. Okay, we'll look at each of those individually. And then we're going to look at the argument of the end of ideology. And that's um, advanced by a political theorist called Fukuyama, and that's saying that um, there will be no more wars based on ideology. So if there is war, it's not going to be because we have conflicting ideologies, like between communism and democracy. If you guys can probably think now, the last time we had a war based on ideology would be something like the Cold War, when we were trying to... Um, contain the spread of communism, right? Um, the next idea would be that any prior wars after the Cold War ended would be based on something outside of ideology. Probably, if you look at what our current conflicts, you might say something like religion or um, cyber warfare. But we'll look at that later. Let's move on. This is a chart that I think is really great. It discusses, right here, you'll be able to see the original classical liberalism championed by Adam Smith. And we'll look at that in the next slide, what classical liberalism is. But you can see that all of the different 
current modern day ideologies basically stem from this idea. This was the first ideology and each additional one kind of just derived from that. And this is going to be your right. You can think of the right as the Republicans or conservative side, left being liber liberal side. The first ideology that kind of sets the foundation for all other ideologies is classical liberalism, championed again by Adam Smith in his um, book, The Wealth of Nations. Um, the Wealth of Nations introduces us to the idea of limited governmental regulation with specifically within the market. Um, also champions the idea of capitalism and capitalist markets. The idea that government need not regulate as much as possible any particular aspect of um, the free market. Then there was a um, an author, a German author named F. A. Hayek, who wrote um, a book called *The Road to Serfdom*. And F. A. Hayek wrote this book in, right after, about 1946, um, after World War II. And remember, he lived during the Second World War. Okay, a German wrote the book directly after um, the end of the Third Reich. So just kind of for context, keep that in mind. And this book. Um, also advocated the idea of a classical liberal democracy. Um, but not only in the United States, he, he asked that the classical liberal vision of democracy should be pioneered throughout the whole world. F. A. Hayek's book um, discusses the idea that the more governmental regulation that you have in the free market actually ends up producing a um, state in which there are no more freedoms for the individuals. Something like a um, an extreme communist state. This link here takes you to a YouTube video, which I won't show you now, but I'll post it, um, discussing how F.A. Hyatt gets from um, what he refers to as planners, which would be governmental uh, regulations, can actually take away freedoms from individuals. So essentially, classical liberalism champions the idea that a free market will regulate the economy, not the economy will be regulated. Okay, The less governmental interaction in the free market, the better. When you have too much governmental regulation in the free market, you end up taking away freedoms from individuals. Okay, and we all know that American society really holds true the idea of having um, lots of freedoms for their individuals, right? Thomas Jefferson even championed this idea uh, when he said society should be as free as possible from governmental interference and that government is best that governs the least, right? So a government, the best kind of government is the one that holds limited involvement, you can kind of remember based on uh, the founding. This was a really strong idea in that John Locke, when he uh, wrote his two treaties of government, said that government ought to exist only to protect the life, liberty, and property of the citizens, and that's it. They shouldn't go any farther. So from about the inception of the United States till prior to World War, um, right before World War II, Great Depression era, American society really held the classical liberal standpoint and most of the uh, decisions that it made and its ideologue, ideolo ideology excuse me, behind most of the regulations that it did. It took a very hands-off approach. Modern liberalism, on the other hand, happened directly after classical liberalism. This happened largely as a result of the Great Depression. Um, the Great Depression was a landmark in American history that kind of changed the whole landscape of what we'll see today. It is the idea that government ought to in intervene in the economy to correct the social ills, right? So government has to protect in the economy against things like monopolies. It is necessary to ensure that everybody has the same equality, equal opportunity to enter the market that the government needs to regulate in order to maintain that equality. This idea also says, um, because it was pretty clear by the late 19th century with the Great Depression that the market cannot regulate itself and people were being 
hurt by the free market failures. A failure of the free market might be something like the Great Depression. Competition without governmental regulation is not perfect and it is unfair and therefore uh, there was a drift to big businesses and limited um, businesses by way of monopolies. So it created a big class system, a system of a large lower class of people. Um, because of this, a hands-off economic system as championed by classical liberalism actually makes things less equal. Uh, contracts make bargaining power unequal, which means the rich employers um, have bigger sway. If you're looking for a job and you're poor and you're desperate, you don't have a lot of bargaining power. If somebody's offering you any job, you're going to take it, right? And so um, modern liberalism champions, <clears throat> excuse me, the idea of power and wage regulations, right to unions, unemployment benefits, health insurance, um, educational opportunities. This is where you're going to see government involvement really growing um, after the Great Depression. So you can see that although there's that similar word, liberalism, classical liberalism and modern liberalism are polar opposites in terms of what kind of governmental regulation they ought to have. Now, classical conservatism came largely from Edmund Burke. He disagreed um, without French liberals turned into radicalism, right? So ideology was devised uh, in one place, became warped when it was applied to a different place. And so <clears throat> Edmund Burke, who was an English thinker, agreed with Adam Smith's free market economy idea, but believed that liberalism placed too much faith in human rationality. Right, because people don't necessarily behave in the most rational, equal um, way. Institutions are created to compensate for human irrationality. Means that things like an individual in and of itself may be irrational, but we have institutions like Congress and the presidency to help um, mediate that. And so we need to have a certain amount of governmental regulation. We need to have a certain amount of governmental influence. But we need to make sure that change, that if we have that governmental influence, it's, it's a um, more permanent structure through the institutions. And change is fine as long as it comes slowly through those institutions because, again, people don't necessarily behave rationally. So we have these protective institutions that can help facilitate change in that way. If there needs to be a change in some governmental policy or some governmental regulation, it needs to come through those institutions. If you don't like civil liberties or if you're uh, against any kind of southern discrimination by way of example, instead of going to the court and having an individual um, civil rights movement per se to change that, you need to go through and have your congressman elected that would help champion the idea of civil rights reform, if that makes sense. So, for example, instead of having social movements and people um, kind of influencing government in some way, we have to have it come through our um, governmental institutions that already exist. I have pictures here of uh, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan because these really are the amalgamation of um, classical liberalism, modern conservatism. These are people um, that associate negative freedoms with classical liberals, okay? The less um, government involves itself with certain things, the more freedoms we have. Uh, these people champion the idea of the free market that Adam Smith does, but puts a lot of emphasis on family values and, uh, and uh, tradition. Here's an example. Alan Greenspan was the uh, chair of the, the Fed from 1987 to 2006. He did not, he ignored the warnings that the housing market was about to pop. Um, he, they said banks would be not... Banks would not be so greedy or foolish as to let that happen. And he reasons, so uh, federal action was not necessary to alleviate what would eventually be a pretty catastrophic housing crisis. Um, instead, he wanted to champion the hands-off technique and let people kind of behave in the way that they'll behave. 
And so things like the Tea Party assume that markets are more efficient than governmental programs, and so they would like the idea of privatizing a lot of things, like healthcare. It's called market fundamentalism. Now, socialism is a very complex idea, um, so I really want to take a lot of time to discuss it. So socialism is an idea that began with the writings of Karl Marx, uh, in which he argued that capitalism would soon be overthrown, capitalism by way of a free market economy like we have in the United States. Um, and socialism would evolve into this uh, utopian society or vision of communism that he describes in his book. Um, but he doesn't ever say in the book what it looks like, what kind of regime needs to be established in order to create this vision of a utopia of communism. That is, a vision in which everybody has enough uh, resources to provide an adequate living, everyone's living happily, everyone has ample amount of leisure time, and the government sponsors most of this regulation to ensure that there is not an overproduction or one class of citizens being disadvantaged to the, um, to the advantage of a higher class. And so Karl Marx says, look, if we don't adopt the idea of socialism, we're probably going to have some sort of proletarian revolution because the proletarians have nothing to lose but their own chains uh, and they have the world to win, right? So because Karl Marx creates this very popular book, he writes this book, um, which he talks about having this beautiful utopian society. Everyone, the, I mean, on paper it makes sense, but the problem is he never said how to create that end. So, for instance, a lot of, because he never said what kind of regime, governmental regime, needs to exist in order to create this system, we have different countries instituting different ways. We have the end, the kind of basic platform of lots of different countries is a socialist economy or a socialist system, but we have different variations of it throughout the world, and you'll see these. For instance, social democracy. Um, this is going to be the same kind of idea of socialism. It's the mildest form of socialism. They promote welfare measures, but not state ownership of industry, so we still have private industry competing in a world market. Um, but they do believe that the government ought to protect certain um, certain things in people's lives, like what welfare. This is going to be something like Denmark and Sweden. It is expensive to live in these kind of things. Incidentally, I believe it was Denmark who has been considered the happiest place on earth for the last four years running. Uh, so they seem to be okay with their socialist democracy. So it's still a democracy. They're going out every couple of years and electing officials to represent them in government, right? But they believe that government of the state should not own industry. They advocate for welfareism. So they will pay, I think, about 53% of their um, income in taxes. Um, these are welfare taxes. That means that you are free to choose how you live in this society, but you have the option to because you are paying taxes regardless of having state-sponsored health care, having state-sponsored higher education, state-sponsored child care. Uh, Denmark has six months of paid maternity and paternity leave, free child care, um, things like that. So you have these options, but because the government doesn't own industry, you don't have to do that. You can choose not to send your child to the state-sponsored welfare or um daycare. You can take them to a private daycare. You can choose to homeschool. You can do whatever you'd like to do because government doesn't regulate that, but they do have the resources necessary to provide for their citizens. And so this has actually been very well received. There's not a lot of um, pushback on the amount of um, taxes that these citizens end up having to pay. They actually really appreciate having the opportunity to have all of this. you It doesn't matter if you make a million dollars or if you make $20,000 a year, you still have access to the same quality health care. You still have access to the same institutions. And this is true equality of access. But this is kind of a, a rarity because you have to have a society of people that believe in the collective nature of government. And that is very...
against the original inception of the United States. So it's going to be, this is why you haven't seen a lot of this kind of push in the United States. We have a very individualistic culture. We have cultures that really champion the idea of limited government. Um, and, and that's how it's been since we've been established. We are not ready and willing to pay 50% of our income in taxes so that other people can send their kids to school. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's, it's just different. Um, places like Sweden and Denmark have always had this idea. Okay, They've always kind of lived under this form of government. And so they don't face a lot of pushback. They seem relatively happy with it. But it's not, it's not any better. One is not better than the other necessarily. Of course, in your eyes, you might think it is, which is perfectly fine. But um, for the most part, it's just we have a different kind of society with different needs. Now, the second one that you're probably going to be most familiar with is the idea of communism by way of Marxism or Leninism, right? Uh, and this is not as pretty of a method of socialism. And you have to remember that. Um, so this is all still under the, the umbrella of socialism. Social welfare democracies is a form of socialism, and so is communism. Um, we have the people who champion this kind are going to be Marxists and Leninists. Um, Lenin imperialism was the amassing of colonial empires by European powers, um, and they were all under, in Marxist terms. So they exploited others through colonization. And they used the excess profits to buy off the working class, um, so we have a lot of extra money, so we're going to try and forestall communist revolution by giving lots of money to the working class, the proletariat. And Lenin said that the revolution could only happen through a small, tightly organized party, and so that's where you're going to see the Bolshevik revolution. Lenin, he remade Marxism to fit the Russian, Russian situation. Domestic markets could not absorb all the goods um, the capitalist system produced, so it found overseas markets. Capitalism had transformed itself, expanding seas into colonies to exploit their raw material, cheap labor, and new markets. And so... Capitalism, in this case, turned more to imperialism. The working class in this kind of communist society uh, was being taken care of relatively well because, again, any excess that the um, working class produced would be used to buy off the happiness of the working class. You might also be familiar with Maoism and Taoism as alternative uh, forms of socialism. Maoism is going to be your most extreme form of communism, okay? Communism as by way of paying off your uh, middle class society to prevent a, a revolution. But instead of paying off them with monetary gain, uh, Maoism did it with guerrilla warfare and per periodic upheavals. Uh, so Pe Mao Zedong was really concerned that the peasants um, were necessary for the revolution and that the revolution would be conducted through guerrilla warfare. And so in order to prevent that, he kind of did these uphe upheavals um, much more disastrously. Now, Taoism was actually uh, more decentralized. It was a partial market form of communism. It was actually more moderate. Um, he advocated that they had to have a very small bureaucratic government and a decentralized state rather than um, having one consolidated large government. And he had a lot of success in Yugoslavia, but it was mostly because he was a, um, an absolute ruler and they didn't know how to properly incorporate Marxism. So Maoism was much more um, radical and Titoism was a more decentralized, and by decentralized I mean instead of having one large regime, he had several small ones. Now, nationalism is the exaggerated belief in the own greatness of one's particular country. So the best um, places, examples I can use to describe that are something like um, American nationalism, or the idea that we have to separate um, Scotland from the, Euro uh, from the European Union. Brexit, the idea that sovereignty brought about the idea of nationality and provides the core of nationalism.
And you can see this through the first time that I, that appeared would probably be in the French Revolution. A we the people kind of highlighted a sense of greatness about the French people. And then Napoleon later mobilized those people uh, in an attempt to conquest Europe under the idea of French nationalism. Nationalism comes from the sense that other nations can be mobilized by elites who are seeking to create a kind of fear-driven society from outsiders. It appeals a lot to emotions, the idea the feelings of the belonging to a nation goes to our psychological core. The belonging, we are Americans and Americans are greatest, we are French and the French are the greatest, things like that. There's also a thing called regional nationalism. Um, and now I'm from Texas, so I'm allowed to say this. <laughs> regional nationalism is going to be like, Texas is the best. Although we're all Americans, the best Americans are going to be Texans. Things like that. California is the same thing. Regional nationalism kind of occurs when existing nations are bo broken into true nations. Like um, Basques in Spain would be another really good example. Mussolini um, in uh, Oh, excuse me, that was too far ahead. So something like Texas is really great, Basques in Spain, uh, they have an ex a particularly heightened sense of national, regional nationalism as compared with the rest of their nation. <clears throat> then we have things like fascism, which would be the most extreme form of a socialist society. They have elements of each of the things we just talked about. Extreme nationalism, they also had racism, socialism, and militarism. Okay, so when you mix up all of those ingredients, you have uh, a Mussolini slash Hitler fascist regime. Takes some um, nationalism, combines it with militarism and a love for order, and creates this pretty catastrophic system of government in which a lot of people are really, really oppressed. Um, Mussolini used to be a socialist, but when he joined the military, it helped champion his idea and sense of nationalism in Italy. And Hitler kind of reinforced that with the final solution. So you hear fascist, you think a certain thing, it's often misused in American culture as being considered by a dictator, but it actually is um, kind of worse than just being a dictator. It's usually a form of militarism that uh, is to the expense of a lesser group of people. I'm sure uh, several of you guys might remember, but in 1989, we have the collapse of the Soviet Union and, as a result, the collapse of most communist states. Um, you're not going to see too many of the prior uh, regimes that we discussed in existence successfully today. We have three key reforms that were introduced by uh, Gorbachev. Um, media openness, or restructuring, and a democratization of their society. You have, I have a picture of David Hasselhoff down there because of his very influential role in the fall of uh, the communist regime in Russia. He just danced on the, the Berlin Wall. That was supposed to be a joke for everybody. So neoconservatism is going to be basically this new idea in the United States that kind of rejects much of the liberal policies that formed the democratic society. Um, saying things like affirmative action gave racial minorities preferential treatment when hiring instead of better qualified rights. whites. That would be something like um, alternative right. Libertarianism is going to be kind of ex your extreme hands-off form of ideology. So uh, emphasis on personal and economic freedom with almost no restrictions on personal liberty. So libertarianism would kind of be affiliated largely with the Tea Party or something like that. Um, but essentially, as hands-off as government ought to be is how it should be. Then we have things like certain movements, like the feminist movement. This was really hard, um, championed in the 1960s in the United States and Western European in the 70s. We have um, environmentalism that kind of sweeps through the nation uh, around the 70s and 80s. And then finally, Daniel Bell, uh, a sociologist, viewed the end of communism as the rise of the welfare state and as a sign that ideology was essentially done. Everybody kind of had a little less to fight about. 
Um, and then Francis Fukuyama, a political scientist, argued that we are now at the end of history and that the days of great ideological struggles are considered over. We don't, we all kind of understand ideology is a preferential choice. We're not going to have any more influence of other nations in the choosing of our ideology or of our regime. But we do know that this opens up the way for other nations, right? Or other, other conflicts, excuse me, things like religion or cyber warfare, what have you. So that's the end of this lecture. I'll post this and I'll post the videos that I discussed as well as any other resources I might think um, will be helpful in doing your lessons, your assessments, and your discussions. Thanks, guys. Have a great weekend.